way to ensure peace is through strength. You want If you want to decrease the likelihood that your military will ever have to go to war, make it a military that could never lose any war. And last but not least, in the 21st century, work will be about skills. Look, when my parents came here, they had no skills. They, neither one had gone to school beyond the third or fourth grade, maybe sixth grade from my mother. But they lived in a time in this country where, despite the fact that you had no advanced education, you could find a job that even with limited skills, you could make a decent living and make it to the middle class. That is increasingly difficult. You know that. It's increasingly hard to find a middle income job or, be, a job or beyond without advanced education. And we today in this country have a higher education system that is not of this century, but of the last. We do not, we, why aren't we graduating more kids from high school certified as welders and plumbers and electricians and BMW? fits all higher education system where unless you're a 19 year old high school graduate that can go to school full time it is really difficult for you to get the skills you need why are we making it so hard for the single mother that I've talked to you about someone I actually know who's a receptionist at a medical clinic the only way she's ever gonna get a raise and by the way she's lost a couple of jobs because her boss wants her to stay till 7 o'clock but she can't because aftercare closes at 6 o'clock she makes nine or ten dollars an hour the only way she's ever going to be able to make enough money is to go from being a receptionist to becoming a paralegal or an ultrasound, ultrasound technician. But she has to work full time and raise a family. We need an education system that allows her to work full time, raise a family, and acquire the skills she needs so that she can go from making $30,000 a year to making $80,000 a year. So she can live the American dream and so can her children. But our education system today is a monopoly controlled by a handful of institutions in the country through, a, through a, a certification process. And meanwhile, there's no competition, no innovation. The prices keep going up and so do the student loans. And the ability to acquire skills keeps going down. And by the way, the number of college graduates that are graduating with degrees that don't lead to jobs is astronomical and unacceptable. And what does this administration and the left want to do? They want to continue to double down on that system that outdated system of the past, triple the amount of money that goes into it. We cannot continue to do that. The second aspect of restoring the American dream beyond work and opportunity is the cost of living, and it's real. And there are two areas I want to focus on. One has already been touched on today, and that's health care. Now, we had a health insurance problem in America. We have it even worse today. But we also had 70-some-odd percent of Americans who had health insurance from their employer that were generally pleased with it. And what this administration did is it disrupted health insurance for every American. Instead of simply focusing on those who didn't have health insurance, they disrupted health insurance for everyone. As a result, today people have lost their jobs. People have lost hours at their jobs. People have lost access to their doctors. They have lost access to their facilities. They have lost the insurance plan they were happy with and they were thrown into a new plan with a higher deductible and a higher co-payment and none of the doctors or hospitals they were used to going to. There are companies that refuse to hire people because they don't know what it will mean for them. This is the reality of Obamacare. And the difference between Obamacare now and three years ago is it's not something people are reading about in the newspaper. It's something that's happening to them. And there will be a revolt in this country against that. In fact, it's already started, and I predict it will happen here as well in the state. The other is the cost of, of education, higher education in particular. It's unbelievable how much loan debt our students are now gaining as they leave school, are getting as they leave school. By the way, when I swore into the U.S. Senate, I owed over $100,000 in student loans. And I was able to pay that off with the proceeds of a book that some of you have. It's called An American Senate. It's available on paperback. <laughs> so, that was a real struggle for us. Early in my marriage, the first few years, my loan payments were the single biggest expenditure in my personal budget. More than our mortgage, more than anything else. There are young people in America today that are stuck with loans like that, but they can't find a job. 
it has increased the likelihood that they'll wind up in bankruptcy or, or unable to buy a home and start their lives. We have to address it. And there are multiple ways to address it, but here's one that I think is essential. Before any student takes out a loan, the school they're going to should be required to tell them, this is how much money people make with the degree that you're seeking from our school. So that you will know whether it's worth it Make an informed decision about whether it's worth borrowing thirty thousand dollars for a job that pays twenty thousand dollars. Let me break it to you: the market for philosophers is very tight. <laughs> so the cost of living is critical as well, because the truth is our wages haven't kept pace with the cost of living in America. The solution to that is not more government; it's robust economic growth that creates not just new jobs but better-paying jobs. 40% of the new jobs created in America under the Obama presidency pay less than $16 an hour. You cannot build a middle class like that. We need higher paying jobs through economic growth and empowering our people with the skills they need so that they can keep pace with the cost of living, save for retirement, send their children to college, and then retire with some dignity and security. Here's the last point that's important about saving the American dream. And that's the importance of our values. Let me tell you why. Because you can't have a strong country without strong people. And you can't have strong people without strong values. The values of hard work and discipline and self-control and respect for others, it doesn't matter how many diplomas you have on the wall, if you don't have those values, you cannot succeed. And you will not succeed. And there is no one born with those values. No one. Every person in this room that has those values, and as Republicans we all do, <laughs> Any, every single person that has those values has those values because they were taught to you. They were taught to you by your parents in word and in deed. You saw it in the way they lived their lives. And the father that got up in every, at 4.30 every morning to go to work to provide for his family. The mother who made your life the purpose of theirs. Those values are learned and they are taught within the family. And that's why family is the single most important institution in all of society. And when But when family breaks down, the result is catastrophe. And I don't care if you come from the left or from the right, no one can deny, and in fact, no one does deny, that the single greatest cause of poverty in America today is the breakdown of American families. So you may ask, what can we do about it in government? I think there are three things we can do about it. We can't pass a law to make people better parents. So here's three things we can do. The first is, our leaders in both parties need to talk about this reality. We spend a lot of time reminding people that smoking causes cancer and obesity causes diabetes. We should also spend some time letting people know that family breakdown causes poverty. The second is, we should never have any law or policy that undermines family life, and we do. Our tax code punishes family life. In many instances, it punishes marriage. Our, some of our safety net programs punish marriage. You realize that if you're on Medicaid and you get married to the father or the mother of your children, you could lose your Medicaid coverage? We should never have any policies in America to discourage marriage and family formation. And here's the third thing we need to do. We need to empower parenting in America. And empower parenting, number one, means having a tax code that's friendly to families. But it also means allowing parents to have the right to send their children to the school of their choice. <laughs> giving, giving parents the right to speak out about their children's education at a meeting without being arrested. <laughs> fundamentally true and your state's a leader in this cause. The only parents in America that do not have school choice are poor parents. The only people in America that cannot choose where their children go to school are poor parents. Go back to the example I gave you a moment ago of that single mother whose son plays on my son's team. If she had the opportunity to send her children to any school she chose, maybe she could find a school where aftercare was open until 7. 
Maybe she could find a school that, that provided their children a better learning environment. Maybe a school that reinforced the faith and the values that she wants to instill in her children. Instead of being forced to send them to a failing school because the government tells her that she has to. School choice is essential. And I, and I would just say this to you. The good news is that we have gained advocates for school choice. Even in the Democratic Party. But not enough. School choice and empowering parents is critical to restoring family life in America. Yeah. Now, I, I just want to close by, I guess, stating something that I find to be obvious. The fundamental question of our time before all of you, in the elections here in the state, the elections of the future, the elections in Florida, is not simply what party is going to be in charge or who's going to be running the government or who's going to be in the White House. That's obviously important, but that's not the central issue of our time. The central question we're being asked is a question that every generation of Americans has been asked. The generation, every generation before us has been asked, do you want America to be a special country? Or do you want it to become an ordinary one? Every generation before us was asked that question, and every single one of them chose to be special. Tonight, with Mac here, we're reminded of the generation that answered firmly, we are not just prepared to make America special. We want the world to be free, and we're honored by you being here tonight. was asked to answer that question. Let me tell you, the challenges they faced were extraordinary. Their parents didn't want their children to go to war any more than we want ours to go to war. Quite frankly, they didn't want to go to war any more than we would want to. But their generation faced a very clear challenge, not just to America's greatness, but to the world's freedom, and they answered it. Now we're being asked to answer the same question, and I would venture, and I would, I would tell you that the challenge we have is not nearly as difficult as the one they had to answer. And that is to, to maintain America as a special and unique nation, one unlike any other in all of human history. Now, oftentimes when I say that to people about how special America is, every now and then you, someone will roll their eyes and say, you know, this thing about America being exceptional, that's something we Americans tell each other to make ourselves feel good. But that's not really true. America is just a rich and powerful country. There have been others before and there will be others since. And I suppose people have the right to believe that. But I know better. Because I was raised by people that know what life is like outside of this country. You see, neither one of my parents had the opportunity to do the things I had the chance to do. My father lost his mother when he was nine. She went to, she died, and he went to work. He worked for 70 years thereafter. I have a nine-year-old son. It's hard for me to imagine him working full time. That's what he did. Mother, my mother was raised in a rural setting by a father who had been disabled by polio as a young child. And he struggled to provide for his family because of his disability. Both of them were born into a country that they loved, but into a society where your future was determined by your past. Whatever it is your family did for a living, that was probably the only thing you were going to get to do. You couldn't go much further than your parents went. It's hard for us, you and I, those of us born in this country who have never known anything new imagine that and it's easy for us to take that for granted what we have here I was raised by people that knew how special it was by people that made it the purpose of their lives to ensure that all the things that had become impossible for them would be possible for us my parents didn't just want us to have big dreams they demanded it. they insisted upon it they wanted us to know from a very young age that we have a privilege that few people that have ever lived ever had 
and that is to be the privilege, the privilege of, of being citizens of perhaps the only nation in human history where the son of a bartender and a maid could have the same dreams as the son of a millionaire or a president. And you know, that became the purpose of their lives. Every time I speak at events like this and I see a bartender standing behind a rollaway bar, I'm reminded of my father because that's what he did for a living. He worked all those years at events like this so one day his children could be sitting at one of these tables or even standing at a podium like this. of their lives. It gave meaning to their days. You know, near the, near the end of my campaign was also the end of my father's life. He, he passed away in September of the same year in which I was elected. He had become sick with cancer and was nearing the end of his life when primary day came around. I didn't have a highly competitive primary. The individual I was running against as a Republican had by then switched to an independent. He is now a Democrat and potentially soon to be a vegetarian. <laughs> Governor Chris, by the way, announced a few days ago that he would uh, potentially be traveling to Cuba, so he may have one more party change in him. <laughs> anyway, I didn't have a very, I didn't have a uh, competitive primary, very competitive primary, but we had one. And my dad was very sick at this point. He was basically bedridden. And so, but he knew I was going to win. And he was proud of it. But he really couldn't get around anymore. So on the night of that election, or the day during the day, I went by my parents' house, they just a couple blocks away from where I live now. And my nephew, they live with my sister, and he answered the door with a big smile on his face. I said, what are you smiling about? My father hadn't been out of bed in a month. He said, come in and see for yourself. So I went in and found my dad sitting in the family room in the back of the house, fully dressed in his wheelchair, ready to go. For the first time in a month, he had gotten out of bed and dressed to go to his son's victory party. Unfortunately, that night he wasn't able to get there because as the hours passed, he weakened and he couldn't go. And I thought about that moment, I still do now, and I think, yeah, he wanted to be there because he was proud of his son, but it was so much more than that. You see, nights like that were affirmation that he mattered, that his life had meaning and purpose. I know that there were days he didn't feel like going to work. My dad worked into his 70s. I know there were nights when he didn't feel like going to work. I know there were days they were discouraged. I remember when we moved our family to Las Vegas because he couldn't find a job on Miami Beach. Someone who had been a bartender for 20 years had to start all over again as a bar boy, working for 19-year-old bartenders. Life was not for them, but they kept moving forward. Because, and I know that when they were my age or, or younger, they had dreams. There were things they wanted to be and do. But those things became impossible for them. And the very purpose of their life became that that day would never come for us. That whatever we wanted to be, we could achieve. And I think that night and nights like that were affirmation that they mattered. That their lives had purpose. That they had something they were leaving behind that had true meaning. That their sacrifice was not in vain. Now that's a testament to my father and it's a testament to your parents who made those stories possible as well. But it's also a testament to America. Because I recognize fully that there are but a handful of nations, if any, where that story would even be possible. And in the end, what we are called to do, why I serve in public office, is to preserve that. I think being that kind of country is worth fighting for. I think being that kind of country is something when you can unite our people around. I think a country that has been bitterly divided by a president that has pitted us against each other is a country that is crying out to be unified behind an agenda for the future. And for me, that agenda is very clear. We want to remain special. We want to be unique. We want to leave our children a country where the son of a bartender and a maid can be anything they want to be. Yes. This is the kind of country we're prepared to fight for. This is the kind of country that we want to leave behind. And our country desperately needs a political movement that makes it the central cause of their existence. And that's where we come in as Republicans. 
The other side says they believe in the American dream, and I don't doubt that they think they do. But the true American dream is not about what government can do for us, but what we can do for ourselves and for our nation together. And that is the calling of our time, to embrace the opportunities of this 21st century, so that we can leave for our children what Mac's generation left for his and what your parents left for you, the single greatest nation in the history of all mankind. Thank you for having me here tonight. God bless you. had asked me, how did you get Marco Rubio, Senator Marco Rubio? And my comment was, I asked him. <laughs> and I am so glad he accepted the Thank you. In thanking, uh, I want to thank you for coming. Um, we have a little gift, and probably, I know you haven't eaten. <coughs> But uh, the chocolate's made in Rockingham County in the shape of um, New Hampshire. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I don't know. <laughs>